All right, so uh, today we don't have much public, but I think let's start nevertheless. Who um, Right, so today I want to start discussing quantum gauge theory. And um, we'll start by looking at the uh, n equal to zero case again, just to appreciate what the problem is. So um, we're looking at the Gaussian n equal to zero theories, typically defined by the action, which is just a quadratic form. And um, we would also usually rewrite it using an auxiliary scalar product and the symmetric operator A. And we were assuming that A was positive, but now let's assume that A is actually non-negative. In particular, this might be that the kernel of A, let me denote it by U, is actually non-zero. So this form is degenerate. So this actually means that the theory has a symmetry. And this symmetry is, is a symmetry by shifts. Phi goes to phi plus alpha. The alpha is an element of U. Right? So in this case, the action does not change. That's easy to see. And if you think about it, it's a gauge theory. This actually means that instead of the space V, the phi takes values, we should actually look at the space V prime which is V mod U. So, right, that's, that's actually the space over which we want to integrate. So, perhaps uh, let, me, uh, let me go into a somewhat more geometric context just for some minutes, and uh, then we return to this situation. So, So let me look at the following somewhat more general geometric story. Um, let's say we have M, a manifold, volume M a non-vanishing top degree form. Uh, we assume there is an action of G, say, connected Lie group on M, which is uh, maybe not free, but let's say, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll, make it, we'll make it more specific what, what the conditions on the action are. So here is the action. Um, so we have um, and we have the following goal. Like let's fix the volume form volume G on G, say. left invariant and we would like to address the following question so define a volume form on M mod G of course, M mod G might be a bad space. Maybe it's not a manifold. 
But if, uh, if the situation is good, for instance, uh, G is compact, the action is free, then M mod G is a manifold and there is, there is a well-defined there is a well-defined question how to define the volume on M mod G. So uh, I would like to offer several answers to this question. Um, so one answer is as follows. So let's choose Let's choose a basis in one EK in, uh, in the Lie algebra of our, of our group such that the batch product in one EK, right? So this is uh, the top degree element in the exterior algebra of G is dual to volume G restricted to the group unit, right? So this is an element of wedge top G star. So the duality between these two spaces is well defined and if this duality is one, so then, so volume G at one, EK is equal to one, right? So um, if we assume that this top degree form is G invariant, then I can do the following. I can consider volume prime equal to the contraction of the vector fields E1, EK uh, with the form volume M. It's easy to check that this volume prime is basic with respect to the G action. can suggest it as an exercise. And so this, uh, this form will descend to M mod G and will define the, uh, the volume form. Now, you see, if the action is not quite free, if there are some, some points where there is some kernel, so then at those points, of course, this form would vanish, right? So in general, it would still define a top degree form, even if the action is not free, but it may vanish somewhere. So if the action is free, it will be a top degree form. Um, now let me offer the second answer. What we can do, uh, so that's our manifold with G action. We can choose a slice, so S, a submanifold of M such that S is transverse To G orbits, right? So it intersects, let's say at least locally, every G orbit and the tangent spaces to, to S and to, to an orbit are complementary inside the uh, tangent space to M. Okay, um, so now uh, we can do the following. Let's assume that S, at least locally, is defined
by some number of functions. Let me call them fi. And i goes from one goes from one to k. So then um, I can take volume of m, and I can write it. as a product of differentials, maybe, better, let me better write it in this way. So I can, I can write it as a wedge product of differentials times something which I call the volume of S, right? So once you fix, once you fix uh, uh, this, the, the, the functions which define my, uh, uh, my subspace, then, then I have induced volume form on the submanifold, right? So um, now the question is, what's the relation between these two definitions, right? Because S, at least locally, is a model of M mod G, right? So M mod G, at least locally, is isomorphic to S. Now we have two, two ways to define the volume forms, and it would be good to compare these two ways. So here, here is the comparison, right? So I write volume prime. So this is equal to this contraction E1 PK of volume M. Now let's make a substitution in this formula, right? So you see, we said that the, uh, the action is transverse. So we apply those, uh, those yodas of E. And if we want to get, we know that the resultant volume form here, it will descend to M mod G, right? So this means that we actually need to kill all of these guys to obtain a non-zero result, right? So in fact, what I want to say, uh, so, so those contractions with volume S, they will not contribute. So you have to, you have to do the contractions between those, those E's and F's. So what will happen? So you have K vectors, which are contracted with K differentials how would the result look like? So there will be here volume S, and here there will be some number, which depends on, which depends on the vectors and which depends on, on differentials. What will it be? So, well, let me, let me write the answer and you tell me whether you so you can kind of, it's, it's going to be a determinant because uh, it's appearing between a poly vector which is a wedge product of k vectors and uh, a differential form which is a product of uh, k differentials so there will be all possible permutations with corresponding signs and uh, kind of uh, the matrix is corresponds to it. It's just a matrix where you differentiate the, the function with the vector field. Right? So that's, that's what, what's going to happen. So notice that this construction up to the choice of this uh, uh, top degree form on G is canonical. It doesn't depend on how I choose the basis. If, uh, if this condition is, is satisfied. And this, uh, uh, this expression, uh, this volume S, in principle, it depends on things. It depends on how I choose this section. It depends on how I choose the functions, right? And that's the way uh, which shows, and this formula shows you how, what, what this dependence is. So that's the canonical volume element with the choices that I made on the blackboard on the right. And this is non-canonical, but it's convenient to work with it. 
And so this, this, this determinant, it shows you how this dependence uh, is presented. So this is called if the pop of determinant because that's what they discovered in studying gauge theory. Uh, perhaps at the next lecture we'll see a little bit of how it shows in gauge theory. But it tells you how the volume forms are transformed. And notice now that if you choose some other section, so then a priori here there would be some other volume form, but this determinant tells you how to correct it and how to obtain a canonical expression which only comes from the ambient geometry of the g-action. So uh, now why are we talking about it? What, what, what does it have to do with our, um, with our n equal to zero gauge theorem? Um, so the idea is as, is as follows. Recall that um, the, uh, the quantum field theory, it kind of takes in two ingredients. One ingredient is the actual functional, and this is basically an ingredient which comes from the classical field theory. And the second ingredient uh, is the integration measure, right? So that's in some sense a purely quantum ingredient. So, um, So we started with the expression with the expression of this form equal to C of H. And notice that in gauge theory, so this does not make sense, right? Because in, you, you have a kernel of A. This means that this integral is Gaussian in some directions. And in some directions, uh, in the directions of the symmetry, the function under the integrand does not depend on, on our variable. And this means that we'll, we'll just have, remember as last time when we had those integrals over the real axis of one, right? So, so this, this, this integral uh, does not make sense in gauge theory. So instead, we should have an integral over v prime, right? Which is v mod u exponential minus one over h s of phi. So s of phi is still well defined. You can think that phi is an element of v or phi is an element of v prime. But now we have some, we need some integration measure, right? So what is this integration measure? So now we know the answer to this question. So we need to fix d phi so integration measure on v and we also need to fix uh, volume u um, the top degree form on U and now well depending on our choices but let's reproduce the choices we had before right so uh, consider basis basis of u such that e1 ek volume u is equal to 1. So then there are two ways again. Either we can say that d phi prime uh, 
is a contraction of those vectors with d phi. Or, which is done more often, uh, choose a complement to u inside v. So we choose a complementary space. We represented as a set of zeros of some linear functions. So this decomposition defines for us Finds for us the uh, measure d phi w on the complement. And the previous calculation would show that d phi prime is the determinant of f i e j times d phi w. Right? So that's, that's just a particular case of what we were doing before. Now, maybe I should say a couple of words about how the physics, about, how, about the physics language. So this choice of splitting, it's called the gauge fixing. And here let me rewrite this integral. is a gauge fixed integral. So here, determinant f i j. Z of h, right? So this is the gauge fixed expression for the partition function. Note that from our considerations, at least in this finite dimensional context, it is obvious that if you choose different gauge fixings, which means you choose different complements, you will get the same expressions, right? So the values of z of h will not change if I, if I change w. In the infinite dimensional cases, so when the dimension is non-zero, typically this is not guaranteed and these are some kind of difficult considerations. So whether different gauge fixings would actually give you the same result. But here more or less by definition, this result is independent of W. So that's the sketch of what we want to do now in the infinite dimensional setting. Uh, okay, so let's try, let's try to do it. So again, um, instead of giving you some general theory, we'll try to look at different examples. I prepared for today three examples and we'll see how far we can get. So the example number one. Mm -hmm. 
So we start with examples in dimension two and then at the next hour perhaps look at one example in dimension three. So it is two dimensional quantum electrodynamics. Um, so recall that the space of fields in quantum electrodynamics at least if we deal with a trivial bundle we'll pass to non-trivial bundles shortly so but if, if we deal with a trivial bundle this is just one forms so A is a gauge field So gauge transformations are A met to A plus D alpha, where alpha is a C infinity function. So this is for the gauge group to be a real line. We'll also consider the group to be U1 uh, in, a, in some minutes from now. So I'll choose M to be simply R2 in my first example. Um, perhaps it's convenient to, so, so here I will have coordinates X and Y. And um, it is probably convenient to write down the curvature dA, which is dx ay minus dy ax dx dy, right? So that's the expression for the, um, for the curvature. And it is convenient to denote this function by small f, right? So f is a two form and it is a function times the standard Lebesgue measure on, on the two plane. Uh, could you recall the action of electrodynamics? There's probably this green part. Sir? There's probably this green part of this part. Free. I mean like so this, this, is, this is a function of A only, right? So there is nothing else. Um, so that's here curvature is just the scalar, right? So no trace. Now here logically this should be an integral. So what's the what's the expression under the integral? Sir? The curvature itself, that's a good guess, uh, but it's not quite true. Right, so, um, yeah. so, that's, that's the, uh, so that's the expression. In fact, if it were the curvature itself, and that you will see a little bit in the exercises, so this would be a quantity which does not depend on extra data, right? That's right, but actually, you're, you're right. So usually in the young mills theory, you saw it, it's a trace of the curvature times its Hodge dual. Now, here there is no trace because everything takes values in R, and actually the Hodge dual is hidden in this, uh, in, in, in this transform that, that, that I made here. Actually, like secretly, Secretly, this small f is a Hodge dual of capital F, right? Because it, it makes from a two form a zero form, right? So therefore, this expression altogether, I can write as f times f dx dy, right? Which is equal to star f 
times f. So f dx dy is a capital F, but this extra small f is star of capital F. Right. Um, so let's think of the um, let's think a bit, a bit more about the gauge transformations and the gauge fixing. Uh, so I have gauge transformations if I write for components. So the gauge transformation for AX is AX going to AX plus uh, dx alpha and a y goes to a y plus dy alpha. Uh, so, uh, so I need I need to find some. Of course, this is an infinite dimensional context, but I need to find some subspace w, right, which is uh, at least roughly transverse to this action. So one standard idea for the gauge fixing one standard idea for the gauge fixing is um, let me do it in the following way yeah is the subspace a y equal to zero It is clear that every uh, that every gauge orbit uh, intersects this subspace, right? Because you can always choose alpha such that a y plus d y alpha is equal to zero, right? Whether it intersects it at one point. Uh, Probably not quite, because you can still choose alpha to be x dependent. It would slightly change this a. But since this is an infinite dimensional story, let's, let's ignore it for a second. So this is roughly roughly transverse. Uh, we'll get back to this discussion of being whatever roughly or non-roughly transfers in a second. We'll see actually what's the uh, criterion. In fact, we can discuss it already now a little bit. Uh, what was good about it? Why, 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 why is this quantity well defined? That's because when you go to the complement of the kernel, you no longer have a kernel in your quadratic form, right? So that's, that, that's basically the question. Whether, whether you believe your quadratic form will have no kernel after you go to this transverse. Um, all right. So one more question that we need to discuss in a finite dimensional context before we go on. So one more piece of the n equal to zero story. Uh, let me recall that, for instance, in the Biggs theorem or later on in the Feynman's theorem, we were looking at the expressions of this form where size were linear forms on our space. Now, what about the gauge theorem? Right? We said that actually we should integrate over V prime or over W. In the gauge theorem. The action functional by definition descends to V prime. Now logically, 
if you, if you want to be able to factor out this u, you have to have these functionals also descend to v prime, right? So, so for this expression to make sense, we require psi i of Phi plus alpha equal to psi of i for all alpha and u. So one forms which satisfy such requirements, they're called observables or or gauge invariant functionals. And so in applying, uh, in, in, in the study of our gauge theory, we should figure out what are the good linear forms that we can, we can look at. So what are the linear forms which should be suitable for the computations in gauge theory? Uh, in, in this theory, can you give me interesting examples of uh, linear forms which would be suitable? So gauge invariant linear forms for quantum electrodynamics. So I want from you at least two examples. So one of them is on the blackboard, right? That's a hint. Uh, the value of the curvature of the Certainly. So, uh, so F at some point on the plane is certainly an example. Right? Now another example which is somewhat more complicated. Perhaps you've seen it. So let's say gamma A simple closed curve. So a map from S1 to R2. And consider an integral of a gamma of A. So this is also a gauge invariant quantity. You, you've seen it, right? Or in the course? Yeah, Wilson, yeah, Wilson loop, that's right. Uh, you can also rewrite it, of course, uh, by the Stokes formula is an integral of f over some surface bounded, bounded by gamma. Right, so that's, that, that's another example. So that's actually this example that we're going to look at. Um, So I'll try to compute the correlation function of exponential of such a, of such a Wilson loop. in two-dimensional quantum electrodynamics. Um, why do I choose such, such an example? Maybe one should say that in more realistic gauge theories, physicists would be very interested in computing such things. But there, we cannot do it. But OK, at least we're taking a realistic example that kind of physics research would be interested in, and we're computing it in some kind of uh, dull and very simple model. So, 
still it has some flavor of um, it has a flavor of uh, of real physics, but it is up to details. You will see, um, it, it's it's almost computable. We'll we'll see what what it gives. Now recall, like last time, we learned how how. Uh, uh, how we should compute it. Let's first write down the answer, right? The answer to such a question, so I'm computing the, uh, uh, I'm computing the expectation of exponential of a linear function, right? Uh, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be what? Uh, exponential h over two. And here it should be appearing of the uh, of my operator to the power minus one, the operator which defines the quadratic form, acting on my linear form, paired with my linear form. Right, formally speaking, that's that's what the answer should be. Now the question is, does it make sense? Right? So let's see whether, whether this expression actually makes sense. So there are several elements there. But the first element is probably to see what about this operator. How does it look like? So let me recall that the action is 1 half integral over R2 F square dx dy. Now, I do my gauge fixing. And my gauge fixing, I forgot what was it. It was a y equal to 0, right? So this will be 1 half integral over R2 dy ax squared dx dy, right? So that's, that's how it looks like. Now if I rewrite it, if I do the integration by parts, so I'll get ax dx dy. Well, so that's my operator. So my operator, so we, we used a little bit like last time in, in our example of free field theory, the operator was the Laplacian. Now it has a similar flavor, only it's kind of easier. It's a second derivative but al along only one coordinate. So that's, of course, it's maybe not very good notation because A is an operator and A is also, maybe should, should I denote it by some kind of curly A. So my, my curly A is minus, minus dy squared. So the differential operator is minus dy squared. Um, so the question is, to what extent it's invertible? That's, of course, a kind of functional analysis question, right? In what sense this operator is invertible? Uh, in fact, the Laplacian was a better operator. Laplacian was more invertible. But this one is still somewhat invertible. And um, So we should write the integral kernel, the Green's function for this operator. Uh, so what do you think? How? Um, so I'll, maybe I, x and y are probably not a good. How should I denote my points? Um, let me say m1, m2, right? So this is x1, y1, this is x2, y2. All right, so, um, so you're saying the absolute value of what? Of, uh, 
Y1 minus Y2. Uh, minus. Okay, let's discuss. Yeah, who knows? Plus or minus at the moment doesn't matter so much, but you will probably get a delta distribution in the y direction. What about the x direction? What? Yeah. So that's that's my that's my suggestion. So I, I think you 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 won't be able to to get this delta distribution from anywhere else, right? This operator just doesn't know about x. Right. So you you're writing the Green's function. This is a very well defined, nice Green's function for one dimensional operator, as this guy is. So there's second derivative, right? It's Green's function is something like something like this, maybe one half plus or minus. But on the x direction, there is nothing. So you have to put in. So this is not a very smooth integral kernel. You have to put a generalized function, uh, a, distri a distribution delta of x1 minus x2. But we can pretend that's 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 an integral kernel. That's, so that, this is a kernel only in, in one direction. So it involves, the inverse involves only integration over y, which is somewhat natural, right? So this problem doesn't want to know about x so much. Right. So remember when I was, when I was saying that our complement is more or less, so, so our subspace is more or less a complement. So that's what I, that's what I meant. So we are able to, to invert our operator. It admits a reasonably nice inverse, but not completely nice. So, but, but still, it's, it's, it's a kind of acceptable, let's say, it's an acceptable inverse for our field theory. It is. We're always integrating over this green function, so it's not a problem with its distribution. Sure. No, of course. Yeah, it will. No, it depends. We'll see. We'll encounter some problems after the break. So there will be some successes and but some failures as well. So at the moment, what, what we have is this a minus one, that's this Green's function, and after the break, we compute the quadratic form and we'll see what it gives. So much? Okay, perfect. So let's continue. So we would like to compute this expression. So let's see how it looks like. So we would like to compute the integral a minus one w gamma w gamma over two points and one on two g of M1, M2, and here we should, re we should represent our our linear forms in the integral form. In fact, let me simply give you the answer and then you will tell me whether it makes sense. So that's, so let's say this is our closed curve. So what's going to happen? Um, so there will be two types of contributions, right? So this is x and this is y. The Green's function has a delta distribution of x1 minus x2, which means that already we should take the points on the curve, which in this particular picture but let me, let me draw a curve like that to simplify my life. Uh, so either this should be the same point or this should be the opposite point, right? So that's, that's what the Green's function going to pick. If it is the same point, then y1 minus y2 vanishes, right? So this Green's function 
in a very uh, special way, it actually vanishes when the points coincide. So, uh, so the so I, I this means I'm not allowed to to, to choose the same point in uh, W gamma one and W gamma two. Therefore, I choose the opposite points. And for the opposite points, what's the value of the Green's function? It is uh, so it will be one half y gamma one y one minus y two. And integral over the common value of the two axes, right? And also, it is possible to choose the first point on the first curve, the second point on the second curve, or the other way around. Therefore, there will be a factor of two. Um, now, what's the, what's the value of this integral? So I integrate over dx y1 of x minus y2 of x absolute value, right? That's just the uh, area inside the surface, right? Area inside sigma. Right, so therefore, result, the expectation value of this Wilson loop, it's equal to exponential minus h over two, so minus from the square of i, h over two, and then here I am inside gamma. Right, that's the result that we obtained, more or less with honest calculations. So we used this notion of gauge fixing. We chose a particular gauge fixing. And the computation all makes sense. The operator is roughly invertible up to some functional analysis details. And the answer makes sense. Here you can imagine just, just to give you an idea, the following type of mass problems. Now you can choose different gauge fixings and try to show that indeed, right, the, the, there is a promise that if you choose a different gauge fixing, the result won't change. Now, in a finite dimensional context, it was obvious, right, because it just some kind of change of variables in a finite dimensional integral. Now, with our definitions, it's not really obvious. It may be true or maybe not true. So in principle, that's a mass problem, how to prove that the result will remain the same. Of course, you can just choose some very simple gauge fixings. Instead of putting uh, a y equal to 0, you can put a x equal to 0, for instance. There, obviously, this will be just the computation of the area using the different different coordinate system. So there, for sure, it will be the same. But you can choose uh, much more exotic gauge fixings, and there it won't be so obvious. So we'll see, we're not completely decided about the last problem set, so we're still thinking about one problem which would be, um, which would be about the changing of the gauge fixing here. Right, so. So what, what in, in, in the n equal to zero case is just some routine calculus. Here, in some sense, it's a research problem, how you, how you show independence of gauge fixing, at least for some class of gauge fixings. Um, uh, 
Uh, I, I would need to think about it because usually the target, you know, if you do in some way, if you do everything correctly and your example makes sense, it should be true, right? So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to think about it, whether there is a meaningful example which would, kind of, but, but there, of course, there should be something, something wrong with it, right, in a way. But, but potentially, yes, potentially it may, potentially it may happen. Um, so let me do, let me do the following example. Uh, let me choose now um, 3D abelian the abelian chern simons theorem. Um, so that's something that you were also looking at in the classical field theory part. So we choose now m equal to r3. Uh, let me denote coordinates x0, x1, x2, but it doesn't matter so much. I could have chosen x1, x2, x3 as well. So the space of fields is omega 1 of our stream. And the action, if I'm not mistaken, so how, how does it look like? So this is 1 half integral over m. ADA or uh, one can write it down in components um, So here I represent it as Gx2. So again, uh, so gauge transformations. So the gauge transformations, how do they look like? Um, A goes to A plus D alpha. And um, the possible way of gauge fixing is the following. Uh, as before, I just put one of the components equal to zero. So let's say A naught equal to zero. Note that if I impose this gauge fixing, then the gauge fixed action becomes very simple. So this is simply A2 denote A1. Right. So um, what's the um, so what's the operator that I have? Let, let me rewrite it in a little bit strange way. 
by doing integration by parts. So let me rewrite it as integral over m a2 t0 a1 minus a1 d0 a2. So this, this is just a cosmetics. I, I, I've done integration by parts. But this shows, um, but this shows that um, the operator, the operator A, which defines our quadratic form, right now it acts on a vector, A1, A2, in, in a, a two-dimensional vector. And um, I think it is this, minus D0, D0, again, plus or minus sign, right? So that's, that's, that's the operator that we have acting on. Acting on A1, A2. Okay. So what's the Green's function for this operator, right? So the Green's function will be two by two matrix and uh, the entries of these two by two matrix, they will be Green's functions for the operator D naught, right? It's a bit similar to what we had before, right? So the, um, so the Green's function, M1, M2, this will be something like the inverse of D naught minus inverse of D naught, where, of course, right, that's a bad notation. So that's the Green's function of, uh, of D naught. So what is it? So what's your? Like a step function. Sorry? A step function. A step function, certainly. Let's, uh, yeah, let's say theta. Of, uh, of what, right? So this guy is an integral kernel. It depends on M1, which is equal to X0, X1, X2, and on M2, which is Y0, Y1, Y2. So it's an integral kernel, which depends on six variables. Right. So what is this? You're right, it's a step function. A step function of what? Logically, it has to be x0 minus y0. Uh, and what about these other variables? It's similar to what we had before, right? It's again some kind of not very nice operator. It all, all something happens along only one axis. Along the, the other axis, nothing happens. Right? So it should be now also you're saying step function. Usually the step function is something like this, right? But eventually, would you agree, I can also subtract or add some constant, right? It can be also like this, or it can be also like this. So let's say for a moment we can stay with this choice of the heavy side function, but um, j j just to tell you that if we look deeper into it, then it will go back to the question whether this is really a gauge fixing, meaning that how, how uh, transverse or how complementary is our, uh, is our subspace. Because this indicates that there are more choices to be made, right? Our inverse is kind of uh, quasi-inverse is not really unique. And this is because we are not sufficiently precise function analytically on this side, right? So if, uh, if my uh, quadratic form, my operator still 
allows for different quasi-inverses. This means I haven't fixed my problem sufficiently well as a functional analyst. And since I'm a bad functional analyst, so that's, that, that's why. But, but in principle, that's how the, here you see that there is some, some question. Right. Very well. Now let's try to uh, let's try to look at some concrete. Let's look at some concrete problem. Uh, using this uh, using this method. Um, well, we already spoke of Wilson loops. Let me choose Let me choose two Let me choose two simple closed curves in our stream. And let's assume that they, they don't intersect. An example that we want to compute is a correlator of these two observables. So they are gauge invariant observables in the chern simons theory. Well, this is a well-defined expression. Defined by the Wicks theorem, which in our quantum field theory context is, is actually a definition. Right? So what does definition say? Um, how is it? Uh, I, should, I should take an integral over gamma 1, an integral over gamma 2, right? And here will be, here will be, a minus one applied to whatever a. Let me write it this way. Um, maybe let, 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 let me write in more detail this w gamma, right? So integral gamma over a, and this is equal to the integral over some parameter. S along the loop, and here how it's going to be sum over i, a i, gamma of s, uh, d x i of s over d s. Right. That's that's the meaning of the uh, integral of a one form. Right. So this means that here will be a minus one gamma i gamma one s one a j gamma two of s two and here d x i over d s d s one dyj over ds2, ds1, ds2. So this is some kind of, here I'm just formally writing down what, what it is. So it's some kind of complicated expression of this form. Now let's try to figure out what it really is. I think the key point is that in the Green's operator, I have this delta of x1 minus y1, delta of x2 minus y2. 
So this means that the contributions are only possible when the x1 and x2 coordinates coincide. So let me think of this picture of this drawing that I have here as a drawing on the x1, x2 plane and the uh, perpendicular axis. The perpendicular axis is the x0, right? So uh, already this means that the only contributions which can possibly occur, these are contributions which are sitting at the intersections on, 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 on this diagram, right? So x, uh, x2 and y2 should be the same, x1 and y1 should be the same, right? Now, um, um, let me uh, let me do the following. Let me give you an idea of the answer, and. Um, Maybe let's leave it as, a, as an exercise to really work out the details. So, um, so we already know that uh, the integral only gives non-trivial contributions at the points T where projections of gamma 1 and gamma 2 intersect. To simplify things, uh, let's assume that there is a finite number of transverse intersections. So we, we, we consider projections, so pi, pi here is a projection to the x1, x2 plane. So there is a finite number of transverse intersections. And because of this, uh, because of those delta distributions, so only here there will be some, some contributions. Now these contributions, one needs to evaluate this integral, right? To figure out what these contributions are. Uh, in fact, it depends on our choice of this function. So let's, let's try to discuss, let, let me try to guess what the answer is and then you try to prove it. Um, I think it will be the following. Uh, if, uh, if it's an overcrossing where the first one goes above the second one and uh, right, so if the first one goes above the second one, uh, then it will be, right, it will be a sign, epsilon p, epsilon p is plus one. If you see at each intersection point, the tangent factors to gamma 1 and gamma 2, they form a basis of the tangent space to R2. And this basis has either a positive orientation or a negative orientation. So it will be plus 1 for positive orientation, minus 1 for negative orientation and this is all for overcrossing because because of this uh, theta and it will be zero and it will be zero for undercrossing so that that's my guess for for for, for this choice you see we, we said that this was actually negotiable right and in particular, for instance, instead of this guy, we could have chosen that guy, right? So for that guy, overcrossings would contribute zero, 
but the undercrossings would contribute plus or minus one, probably with the opposite sign. We could have also chosen this uh, skew symmetric one, right? Then we would have got halves, one half for overcrossing and one half for undercrossing. Now, recall that we said the result should be independent of the choice of the, uh, of the complement. Secretly, we are changing the complement when we are choosing a different Green's function. So one claim is that the result is independent of, uh, of these choices. Another claim. So uh, you, you studied quantum topology for quite some time. So, so this is a very elementary link invariant. What, what, what is this link invariant? That's a link in number, up to maybe sine or maybe one half coefficient. So that's, that's a link in number. Uh, for, for instance, here, right? So these two, uh, these two uh, curves are linked, and the link in number should be plus or minus one, right? There is only one over crossing, so the other one is under crossing, so the under crossing doesn't count. The over crossing gives you plus or minus one, depending on how you choose the orientation. So, for instance, in this example, it works. And if I were to change, right, so if I unlink them, there will be two overcrossings with opposite orientations, and they would, would have canceled each other, right? So, so this, is, this is actually, so that's the linking number. The linking number of those two links. Um, now let's discuss the following. The following issue. Um, so we said that. So we said that we were computing this expression, which is formally something like this. So for, formally, this is this this is this is something like this. Um, now, uh, imagine that we apply a diffeomorphism to our space R three. Well. Here, that's an integral. The chern simons action is an integral of a differential form. Uh, so this, uh, these expressions, these are integrals of differential forms. Integrals of differential forms are invariant under diffeomorphisms, right? So that's the standard fact of uh, differential geometry. This means that under the actions, formally speaking, under the action of diffeomorphisms of M, this should be invariant. What does it mean, the action of diffeomorphisms of M? If you apply diffeomorphisms of M to this link, in principle, you can change its position and the diagram, so you would get an isotopic link and the diagram in general would change, right? So you expect if this machinery works, the answer should be, should be an invariant of those diffeomorphisms. Um, since we, we computed it and we see its linking number, we know it is invariant. The question is, uh, is it a proof? Or can it be, for sure, how we made it, it's not a proof, but can it be developed into a proof, right? So in principle, field theoretically, we expect it to be diffeomorphism invariant. Physicists would tell you, well, look, it's obviously diffeomorphism invariant. So, so this thing is diffeomorphism invariant because we computed it this way. But for us, 
kind of uh, can this uh, can this reasoning be developed into independent proof of the fact that the linking number is invariant under the diagram change because I computed it from the diffeomorphism invariant field theory, right? In this case, maybe yes. Who knows? It's a very simple example. In general, such questions pose difficulty. Let's say we can guess that we hope that the result should be should be invariant under isotopies of links, and then we can try perhaps to prove it by other means. Up to now, I would say, like a field, theoret field theoretic guess is, a, is, is something which happens very often. Field theoretic proof, something which d doesn't happen that much. So in, in principle, I would say um, it would be good to have one day machinery which where I wouldn't need to, to make this speech. Where I would say, okay, you know, like kind of our field theory was different more similar variant. Now we know, well, it's obvious that this, uh, this expression is, is invariant under isotopies. Um, maybe one, uh, <clears throat> maybe one small counterexample or counterexample. Let's say this was this was a very nice cal cal calculation, a very beautiful calculation, and it will be an inspiration next time for us to think for to look for something similar in uh, non-abelian Chern-Simons theory. Uh, but let's let let's let's give a cal calculation which fails in the abelian Chern-Simons theory or fails, not doesn't doesn't clearly make sense. So recall that in two uh, D Young Mills. I computed for you the expectation of IW gamma of A. So let's forget about one of the gammas. So I only keep one of them now. Well, here it is. Well, by our recipe, is defined as an exponential of a over 2, a minus 1, i w gamma of a, i w gamma of a. Well, this looks good, right? We computed such an expression in the Young Mills theory. What about the Chern Simons theorem? So, uh, because, of this, uh, because of these delta distributions, uh, only the points on these two copies of gamma, which are, which, which are at the same point on the x1, x2 projection, contribute. But now there will be many points like that, right? So, for instance, this point on gamma 1 and the same point on gamma 2, right? So that's, that's a point that would contribute. The difficulty here with this point is that I have theta of x0 minus y0. Well, theta was a heavy side function. What is theta of x0 minus y0? No, we don't actually know, right? So this does not make sense, or I mean, it's it's not defined because of uh, for this reason, this expression does not make sense. Um, well, at some point, I told you the following wisdom in. Physics or in physics related stuff, once you encounter a problem, you need a nice name for it, right? So that's the first, the first approach. That already advances you quite a lot. Uh, so this is called this is called the framing anomaly. So in principle, it should make sense, but it doesn't. Now what? 
Uh, why, why framing? So anomaly, that's because it's a problem, right? It's a, it's a synonym of the word problem. Uh, now anomaly, what does it mean? You see, imagine that I take one of those copies of gamma and I shift it a little bit. Right? Now, all of a sudden, if I shift it, I can generically shift it in such a way that the intersections between b become transverse. Now, it does make sense, right? But it depends on how I shift it. Shifting it means what? That I introduce a unit vector orthogonal to my curve, right? That's if we go back to like study of curves and surfaces that you did probably on the first or second year of the university, this would mean a framing for your curve, right? In 3D, so you have one vector, you can choose a positive frame which consists of the tangent vector to your, to your curve, to this unit vector, and there would be the third vector which is automatically given. So you equipped your curve with a framing. Once you have this framing, you do know how to shift it. And once you know how to shift it, then this would be, this, this expression would make sense. So this would be a linking number of uh, your original curve with something, right? But this means that quantum theory, remember that, 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 that was the case with, with conformal field theory, right? So uh, the classical field theory of a scalar field didn't know about scaling. But it turned out that quantum theory does know about it. And so it has more structure and knows about how things scale. Now, all of a sudden, uh, the quantum chern simons theory in the abelian case, it knows more or it wants to know more about the geometry. You cannot just put in a curve and define a Wilson line. You have to equip it with a framing. Once it is equipped with a framing, all such expressions, they start making sense. So, um, so this, this is a, a very interesting phenomenon that quantum theory kind of tells you what uh, it orders, what kind of geometry it wants to have. So, um, Okay. Uh, I wanted to show you one more example, but uh, probably it doesn't work for today. I'll see whether next Thursday we'll, we'll have time for it, or maybe next Thursday will be completely about non-abelian gauge theory and primarily uh, non-abelian 3D churn assignments. I would like to remind you that uh, next, next Thursday, right, uh, it will be official holiday. So, but uh, I have a key of the room, and I don't know your cards, whether they, they open, but my, my card opens the door, and uh, I'll give you in a second the code for the door downstairs in case it's closed. So we can enter the building, then enter the math department, and even enter the room. <laughs> 